woodcut triptych, my latest one. It's called Electric Baloney Land. And uh, it's all about American culture. Gone down the proverbial shitter, as we say here, as played out through uh, a local county carnival slash fair. And uh, it's, it's, um, it's really just sort of a, a, an allegory of American disgust in a way. And in my, my work, I kind of like to tread the line between whimsical and terrifying, <laughs> pretty much. Um, there's a lot of humor in my stuff, uh, a lot of dark humor, satire, and that comes from all of my heroes that I like to look at. Um, when I was growing up, Albert Durer, um, Hogarth, Goya, Posada, all the great printmakers. And uh, I, I say it all the time, my, I have to come into the studio every day and make prints that are as great as my heroes made. That's what I try to do. Um, takes a long time. It's pretty physical, pretty mental, but you know I make a living at this, so I get to wake up in the morning and and draw and carve crazy stuff like like a heads of state shooting gallery <laughs> of the world's worst dictators in history. You know, so I get to do this for a living. So this, uh, does your work upset people? Yeah, yeah. and. It, it, it upsets, but I don't really care because it, it not in a oh I'm worried about offending offending someone. I, I really don't care about that. Um, Crumb said it best. It's lines on paper, folks. If you're going to get upset or offended by this, you, you mean to tell me you're not offended by Donald Trump? You're going to get more worked up over the over the the, the stuff that's fiction and um, art. I want people to think uh, for sure because I want to be a, a, like Hogarth, one of my big heroes. He was a mirror to society. That's what his function was as an artist. He was holding up a mirror and saying, look at how fucked up we are. Uh, that's what I'm trying to do it is, is show um, the underbelly, the the disgusting nature of America and the world in general and uh, you know what I think is important and how America pretty much is has lost its way where does that come from but I always rela relate it through my personal experiences all of these are things that are there's always a personal story in uh, the starting point for my satire and, and depiction of things. So when I was a kid, we would go to county fairs and you could like throw a ring around a unicorn head and win a Rambo knife that was real. You could win throwing stars that were real. <laughs> and they, they were not toys and, and bull whips, like real bull whips. So you could leave the county fair armed. And so it, that's America, you know, at a, at a young age you're indoctrinated into that gun and weapon culture. I like, you know, I think guns are cool. I like, I like war movies, I like violent movies like Pulp Fiction, Reservoir Dogs and things like that. But they shouldn't be in the hands of novices, okay? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but that's sort of what my, my work, it used to be about just rural America and hillbillies, what we call hillbillies, doing bad stuff. Hmm. It's grown over the last 20 years into like a broader based social commentary where it's more of about the human condition in a broader sense and our culture, world culture too, but it, it's really, it's very American. <laughs> Um, and it, it's I've started thinking way more politically in my work, and but also more metaphorically, more allegorical, and uh, 
not always just delivering a blatant straight message. I want people to think things are disguised in in analogy and metaphor and symbolism and all that stuff. Because uh, I, I get a little more surreal at times. Um, but the basic idea too is these are prints, okay? And they're any time that you can make copies of something, more than one, there's a tendency to spout off about things. It's like having your own newspaper. Oh, yeah. And so, especially when I was a kid, when I first discovered printmaking, um, I just obsessed over the history of it right away. And um, when you delve into it like I did, uh, the history of prints, and you, in about a year's period, from the time I was 21 to 23, I, I just, year two, uh, I just totally inundated myself with the history of prints. And when you're in it like that, uh, you when you look at the history of prints, there's a, a constant theme throughout it, a constant approach, and it's social commentary and criticism through the guise of a lot of dark humor. <laughs> you know, that's a hit, that's part of its history, and so I wanted to be like those guys. I wanted to be like Posada and Dewar and Goya and Daumier and Hogarth and, and Cruikshank and on and on and on. Those are all my, my favorite artists of all time. But I also felt, on a more spiritual level, when I did my first print, I felt like I had found what I was born to do, but also when I started obsessing over the history of Prince, it was like finding members of my family, my my genealogy. I take that that lineage very, very seriously. So like every single day that I come in here to carve or draw or whatever, to say it again, I have to make, I want to make prints that were as good as Goya and as good as Dürer. Uh, because number one, I know I can do it, but also, I want to be part of that great history and that lineage. It's just, I'm a fan, totally, of, of print history. It's an incredibly rich history of, of artists that use their imagery to push social buttons in the face of oppression, the German Expressionists. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I love the German Expressionists. I'm, I'm sort of a weird hybrid, I guess between the German Expressionists and the artists of the 15th century of, of Northern Europe. Be, it, with my use of black and then my use of dark imagery. Um, but a lot of what I do has, has its roots in the history of it and a consideration for the history of it. I work in triptychs because of my love of Flemish painting of Northern Europe. I love triptychs. I like narrative and I like telling a story in parts. Um, also, my size, the reason I work this large is because the same reason the Dürer worked large, those prints by Dürer were that big. Yeah. When woodcuts before it were that big, he was working on a large scale. He blew people's minds. Well, I want to do the same thing. I want my stuff to compete with, with painting and yeah. sculpture. So, so... I also want to overwhelm the viewer too. I want to knock them on their ass right away because I'm also an entertainer. You want to grab your audience and pull them in somehow. I, but I will say, you can be pulled into a print that's this big just as much as you can be pulled into a print that's this big. Um, but these are woodcuts. And woodcuts that small don't necessarily graphically hold up that much. So I'm going large. If Dewar would have had plywood, it would have been a totally different ballgame now. You know, but he didn't. So um, I've always also been a fan. There's a lot of stuff in my work. I've also always been a fan of, of, of heavy music that had great album covers that were, had medieval tendencies. You know? Yeah, and, uh I've also been a fan of underground comics for a long time. Robert Crumb, Crumb Gilbert Sheldon, yeah. uh, the, the, the Furry Freak Brothers, and, and <laughs> yes. I, I love Robert Williams. Oh, yes. I like Victor right. Moscoso. I love that stuff, too. Yeah. And Basil Wolverton, who did the first Mad Magazines. Oh. I love that stuff. 
uh, because it's so transgressive and, and in your face and and just again anti-authoritarian, mm. especially for the fifties. Uh, that kind of imagery that made people scared. Kids liked it. Parents hated it. I, I really try to do that in my work now. Um, I want people to sort of like when they when they go into the, a gallery or a museum or whatever and they see my work, they're like ah, they run away from it. But then all of a sudden they're peeking back around <laughs> the corner and want to go back to it, kind of like Bosch or Bruegel. You're always they were always bringing viewers back to find new little nuggets of info, visual info to, to dwell on and consider. So I'm always trying to, I have a lot going on in my images and I'm always trying to bring people back into it. Well I've noticed that with your stuff, there's, there's just little bits, and you notice that with jewelry as well. You look at it and then you find these little yeah. details everywhere around yeah. their print. I've, I'm having to do usually about 15, 15 weeks of work or 20 weeks of work in about seven weeks. One of the questions I was going to ask you, like, um, what's your daily routine like? How do you time manage and do this? My daily routine, aside from now, because I have a, a studio full of, of, of workshop, woodcut boot camp that's going on right now. Right. It's my yearly workshop, but my normal daily routine is I, I drive, into the, drive into work, um, I, I come in here, I check my email or whatever, I'll go on CNN and then NBC News and all those and I get pissed off <laughs> and then I, I haven't even had my coffee yet, then I'll make coffee, while that's making I'll go back over to the computer and I'll look at the daily, the dailies. And I take a deep breath, get calm myself down, and then I come in and I carve for about eight or nine hours. <laughs> listen to music and carve all day. Sometimes I'll put the radio on and listen to the news and scream <laughs> and yell and rage while I'm carving. But my day is really lived out creatively and work-wise in areas that big. So I'm coming in and I'll do an area maybe this big in a day if I can, you know. Yeah, and what amazes me, I was looking at the, the centerpiece for this, is your, your cross-hatching. Yeah. It's like ink cross-hatching. Mm -hmm. I carve all that out. And you carve out all the little gaps between the cross hatching. The thing about it is that there aren't a lot of people in the world that are willing to sit down and do this kind of work with that amount of time because we live in a world that everything is instant gratification. You can get everything so fast. Yes. And in a way, it seems like you're pissing in the ocean these days, but I'm trying to slow it down a little. This is my way personally of slowing it down. My life is so out of control on so many levels all the time. I'm overwhelmed by Kid, my kids, and not in a bad way, but it's like, oh my God, it's, you're trying to keep up with all of, the, all of it. This is the only place that I can slow everything down, where I'm the judge, jury, and executioner. I can control, I'm in total control of, my, of this world, yeah. okay? Everything else is fucked. Yeah. Everything else can be, you know, falling down around you. I, I, I saw a thing about maybe it was Pete Townsend or someone he said the only time I actually feel totally safe is when I'm plugged in <laughs> okay. and my okay. guitar is in front the only place where I feel really totally okay is when I'm in my drawing and carving world yeah. and then you finish them and you put them out in the world and you and you see what kind of a response you get I get a kick out of it uh, I, there's uh, definitely people that don't like it but even the people that don't like it have to deal with it. <laughs> you know? I've seen a mi many a print curator at fairs, at art fairs, come up to my my work and just shake their head and walk off. And then there are other ones that that are these at these big time institutions that are just like, oh my god, this is great. So it's just like either or. And in the public in general, it's the same. People are either I don't like that I don't want, I don't want to deal with it, or people just get totally sucked into them as narratives and stories and wonder what in the hell this is all about. 
I don't all ever want to totally give away what my message is either. You know, was there a really smith marketing plan you had to sell your work, or did you just do what you want and then just sell it, or did you get lucky? How did you? A combination of all of that. With I don't know about the word slick. When I got my first body of work done, which was called Two Weeks in August, 14 Rule Absurdities, I had a choice. Uh, I did. It sp I spent three years on this set of 14 woodcuts. I didn't know what to do with them. Uh, I showed them to a former teacher of mine, and he was like, "You did, the, you did this in three years." I was like, "Yeah. What am I going to do with it now? I want to show it to somebody." He was like. He's like, Tom, you could sell these out of your car. And I was like, what are you talking about? And he, he was like, make appointments at museum collections and at print collections and just go straight to museums and show these things to the curators. And I was like, okay, I'll do that. Yeah. Absolutely. And so I didn't make appointments. I, I just got in the car and drove that set of prints around to these museum collections and just walked right in off the street with a big box of prints and the first place I did that bought, bought a whole set this like top museum like high level museum bought it right away and I had never shown the work to anybody just because I just did it I went went for it and I was my own dealer and I was my own gallerist or whatever and I, I sold right away to museums the stuff. I, I kind of knew what I had, the body of work bag. I knew back in 1998, um, I knew that no one had, was really doing woodcuts like this um, at that time. And and with the, the tall tales and the rural satire is what I called it, all stuff about my hometown. And I started selling the museums right away. And that, if I hadn't done that, gotten lucky in that regard. I don't know for sure if I'd still be doing this like this or not. Because it because I was collected right away by museums, it's sort of uh well, it was pretty ballsy just going up to it was pretty it was crazy is what it was. And I think about that now, I'm like, I would never do that now. But when you're 20 four, 25, I didn't have anything to lose. I, I, I had nowhere to go but back to my parents' basement. And I was okay working on these prints in my parents' basement. That was okay. I could only, I only had a place to go up. I've always been in this, I think, for the right reasons. You know, I'm in it about the work. I'm not in it uh, for anything else. I just want to make the work. No one here is riding around in Lamborghinis or anything, you know? <laughs> so we have pieces of shit cars and... and uh, we, you know, all of my money that I make goes back into the making of this. Mm. You know, it always is that. Um, but it's a, it's a shitty business. <laughs> Contemporary prints, pro, make, being a professional printmaker is a tough business, man. It's very, I don't want to say it's competitive, it's just, it's hard to maintain atten people's attention. Especially every passing year, things get faster and faster and faster. And you know, these things don't look good on Instagram, okay? Or on Facebook. When you take something like this and you shrink it down to like two, an inch and a half by five, it doesn't have the same effect. So, yeah, people swipe by it, you know, you have to see these things in real life. So yeah, there was a little luck in there, but a little determination as well. The marketing, to back, back to your question, to get more into the marketing of it, uh, I ripped off a guy named Bill Thick, who's one of my dear friends, oh, yes, and right. a huge influence on me. Uh, he would send out posters of his work um, to all these print shops all over the country and to whoever was on his mailing list. And he had it figured out that at the very least, the image that he created existed in that way. So if you got a poster in the mail, you're going to stick it up on your wall. It's, a, it's such a cool image yeah. to begin with. And people put those things up on their walls. And so when I was a student and I saw Bill's work hanging in a print shop or print shops all over the place, I was immediately taken with it. And on it, it said, you know, 
Cockeyed Press, New York City. That was the name of his shop. And I was like, oh my God, Cockeyed Press, it's got to be this amazing place. <laughs> and I went out and I visited him, and Cockeyed Press was a closet with his press in it, and Bill sleeping on egg crate foam underneath the press every night. I was like, oh, I get it. I get it now. And so I started Evil Prince, and, and it was more of a name. We figured out that as independent printmakers, to compete with the Crown Point presses, the Landfall presses, the, the Tyler Graphics of the world, or the Tandem presses, you have to have a press name, and, it ha and you can at least create the illusion, if the work is strong enough, if you create the illusion of it being a big time press, it's going to eventually be seen as a big time press. Mm. So we're independent self-publishers. And you know, most independent self-publishers, they work in, in the school system. You know, that we, we, didn't, we didn't have the luxury of that for one thing because our work, frankly, we weren't getting hired no. by in, in tenure track teaching jobs and all that because sometimes, you know, we're not the best behaved bunch of guys. The outlaw printmaker guys and all that. And we have, we're strongly opinionated. We don't like to conform to rules that well. And, and it's just, it's in our work too. We portrayed ourselves as independents that, is ju that are just as important as the big printmaking shops that publish blue chip artists. Yeah. Why not? And I'm really lucky, very fortunate that me, my, myself, and Sean Star Wars, and Bill Fick, and Dennis McNett, and Carlos Hernandez, and the Hancock Brothers, and, and, and Catherine Polk, and Artemio Rodriguez, we all found each other. Mm. You know, through the mail, through shows, through whatever, and we became this like bunch of, they're my best friends. Those guys and gals are my best friends. It's like a movement now. It is a movement. And I like to say, you know, I can't believe you know, we have our own inks. Yeah. <laughs> Which is crazy. Um, Sue Co, one of my biggest heroes ever of all time, and she was in a few of the early Outlaw Printmaker shows. I love Sue Co's work, and I, I went to a show by her, a show that she had in Atlanta this past spring, and it was a set of her woodcuts that were up, and she told me she used my ink to print her work. And if you could have taken me, if I could time travel back to my 25-year-old self, looking at Sue Coe's work and just being blown away by it and being heavily influenced, and, and you could tell a 25-year-old me, oh, well, guess what? One of your heroes is going to use an ink for one of her bodies of work named after you. I'd be like, fuck off. What, what are you on, you know? Things have taken a crazy turn for this group of artists. And it, it's really, it's a, it's a real brother and sisterhood, a family of like artists that I, I don't think our, our plan, we didn't have a declarative statement, we're going to take printmaking back to the way it should be about social commentary and criticism and doing it your way. But that's really what it's about. And it was really started by Richard Mock, who myself and Bill and Dennis we all knew Richard, and he was a he was a a printmaker who did a linoleum cut on the op-ed pages of the New York Times one a week and or more. He was a real it from the early '80s until the early '90s. He was a a a modern day Posada, and we all saw his work. My parents they got the New York Times, you know, and I saw Richard's prints growing up, basically, and uh, they had a huge impact. They were very political, highly graphic, uh, social justice and commentary driven, and we got to know him, and when we met him, when I met him, he was this hard drinking, hard fucking, hard living dude who just lived off of his prints, man. You go into a studio in in, in Red Hook in, in Brooklyn, and it wasn't the hipster paradise that it is now over there. He he was living in a in in squalor, but 
he, he his blocks were piled to the ceiling and there were old Jack Daniels bottles everywhere and penthouse and hustler magazines laying around. I saw I walked in there and I was like, this is what I want to be. <laughs> I want to be that. And you're, I was 26 years old when I met that guy, one of my heroes. You know, yeah, that's gonna have a and the imagery backed it up. I mean, he 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 walked it like he talked it, and he was about he was a good, far left leaning artist, far left, like Frida Kahlo far left almost. Yeah. And and I was just totally taken with it, and so was Bill. Bill Fick. And so that little trio kind of started the whole outlaw printmaker thing. Sue Co was out there too as well at the same time and and she you know, she was older, she's like Richard age. They were like our mentors, you know. But it became this whole thing and, and we called it Outlaw Printmakers because that was the name of a show that we had together. Tony Fitzpatrick in Chicago, this great etcher artist, etching artist, he, he he was like, well, let's just call it the Outlaw Printmakers, and that's how it got its name. That first little bitty show in a basement in New York, basically a basement gallery, and that's how it started. And then other people, a lot of people went to that show. A lot of people saw that show. It got a little review, and um, it really hit the the New York printmaking kids hard, I think. And then there's this whole second wave of, of kids that came around doing that stuff, like. Cannonball Press guys and the Drive By Press guys and a lot of kids at Pratt and all that. But uh, I'm pretty proud of it. You know, I'm pretty proud that we actually we did something. We did we we changed. I think a little bit of contemporary printmaking. I think you know the tattoo tattoo kids doing printmaking now. That's like just far out. I had no idea that we would have that sort of impact, but I also think that uh, there's going to be a lot of crap out there too coming from it because people, I think, tend to look at it as a one-trick pony a lot of times. Well, if I just come up with the most outlandish zombie snot dripping monster, that's okay. Mm -hmm. I think there has to be a little bit more than that. I was going to say, what is your favorite tools, ink, paper, and wood? Okay. All right, that's a lot. There's a lot there. So tools. I use uh, a Frankenstein set uh, that I, my parents got me when I graduated. They bought me a standard set of Hangatos from uh, McLean's. Uh, yeah, I use Japanese wood gouges, and I wrap them in hockey tape. Hockey tape, yeah. Yeah, because. I get a better grip like that, okay. and they come with uh, they come with cool designs on them. And uh, this stuff has it has stickum in it, which helps you get a better grip. But also the 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 wider that you make the tool, it's more ergonomic, I guess. The okay. way that you say it helps, it, it's easier on your hands. So I you and but I use the hunk of toes that most people cut them off. Mm -hmm. I didn't know any better when I got the set. I didn't know that that's really what you're supposed to do, so I really got used to, to using the long, leaving them long. And what happens now is when I'm in a long carving session, I'll move my hand back okay. to really help with get more torque and go easier on my hand, so I like having the long handles for that. Um, but the, uh, they're Japanese steel. Japanese steel is the best steel to use. Uh, Swiss made is just about as good and then British steel's third uh, in the Judas Priest sense, British steel. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, yeah, Japanese steel is what I like. I like v, the V gouge, this size of V gouge is what I use for almost everything. I'll use a U gouge as well. Uh, but back to my set, my set is like a hybrid. I'll use the smaller uh, Japanese wood gouges combined with the larger ones too. Um, and then my favorite ink, my favorite ink is Tom Huck's Outlaw Black, of okay. course. <laughs> and the UPC number ends in 666. That's on purpose, the yeah, number of no the beast. And my two favorite things really in the world, I guess, other than, other than, you know, Prince by Dewar and Motorhead Music is like George Dickel whiskey. 
<laughs> combined with Tom Huck's Outlaw Black. Those are the two best things that you could possibly have in your studio, I feel. Right. Um, but I like inks that are stiff because of the, the detail that's in my work. My ink has to be really stiff. Uh, so it was cool to be able to help to work on an ink that was um, suitable to my needs that had I didn't have to work up as much and make work. So is that like from Speedball or is that? It's from Gamblin. Gamblin yeah, makes it, yeah. Nice. Bill's ink, Bill Bill's Fix ink yeah, is Bill's Speedball. Is so we're in like a little ink feud oh, yeah. right now. Bill and I have engineered an ink war. <laughs> all things. We laugh about this, like, can you believe this? We got inks, our own inks now. So I did the ink, I did my tools, the paper. For years, I used Western heavyweight printmaking papers like Arches, um, Reeves, uh, German etching, um, Somerset, satin and textured, mm -hmm. and those heavyweight papers. I have stopped using those now. Uh, as my work has gotten more delicate and with finer lines over time, I found that embossment which comes with the heavier weight papers is the enemy of fine line work. Yeah, uh, it really doesn't suit my stuff. So I use Japanese papers now. Okay. Uh, I I love Okawara. I've used Sakishu. I've used uh, Udamara. I think is what it's called. So but you, do you have them fairly thin? Or it's very thin. It's the Okawara. Nice. Uh, Okawara is what I like. Use. I'm not going to use heavyweight papers for my woodcuts anymore. I'm mo I'm using nothing but. So does that Japanese mean you've papers. knocked back the pressure on your press to get no, the paper here? So uh, we, we print dry. Okay, yeah. Um, with the heavier weight papers, I used to dampen to get these heavy, rich blacks, but I found that with the right amount of pressure, the right felt on the press, which is, I just use a pusher felt. Yeah. I don't use any other felts. The hard top felt in an etching trio. Yeah. I use the pusher felt. Uh, it helps give those. It helps you to get those heavy blacks. Okay. Um, but you want to minimize the embossment. There's always going to be a little embossment. Yeah, yeah. But I have to minimize it, and Japanese papers are the best way to do that because of the thinness of it, as well as the slickness of it, and the minimal tooth to the paper. So uh, yes. I'm, I'm I'm going to be up over the next few years trying different kinds of Japanese papers because there's a wide range of those out there. Uh, Kitakata. I really like that paper. I did this print of a Warmadillo recently. Um, it's a chiaroscuro block, and uh, these are chiaroscuro blocks, gonna be. Um, and I really like the Kitakata paper a lot. I, I like the papers that um, are objects too. I like that deckled natural edge. I, I like, I love the way that looks. And also, I kind of like, uh, I, I'm moving away from the need of the bright white as well. I like more of an off-white now for, for my stuff. So yeah, there's my the paper that I like. I used to love for uh, Somerset texture and set, but then they were bought up by, by that Epson company and they changed everything and it was really stiff and had tons of sizing in it and it was just that was kind of the end of me you know using those papers western papers uh, now look if I do an etching I'm not gonna print those on on uh, on Japanese papers I'll, I'll use heavier weight papers if I do a litho a stone that's gonna be on the heavier weight papers but for my woodcuts I'm using nothing but uh, Japanese papers from now on the wood Okay, uh, my wood is uh, finished grade birch plywood, three quarter inch. Uh, you can also, comparable to, to marine birch. Uh, I like the three quarter inch thickness because it tends to be a better quality than anything thinner. Um, it's plywood, so I don't have to carve that deep. Um, and I get it in giant big sheets. I don't buy it at the local uh, like box superstores. Here we have Lowe's and Home Depot. I don't buy the stuff there. I get it from mom and pop independent shops. They have better quality okay. wood. They just have better quality lumber. And I'll go to the lumber yard and, and pick out sheets. 
or hardwood specialty stores. Uh, I'll do a little bit of both. Uh, this this uh, wood came from a place called St. Charles Hardwoods, and and uh, they that sell finished grade birch plywood. Birch is a it's a good medium hard wood. Uh, back in the old days, the Durer era, he used pear and apple and cherry, the fruit hardwoods. Uh, these days, we have plywood, like I said earlier, but uh, birch is a good medium hardwood. It holds a lot of detail. The grain's tight, so it holds a lot of detail, but it's, it's soft enough, just soft enough, that it doesn't wreck your hands as you carve. It's still very hard to, to carve, but um, it holds a lot of detail. It's, it's really good. The harder the wood, the more detail that you can get, the less splintering mm -hmm. that there is. That's the best splinter you ever repair. They don't use that. I, my stuff doesn't splinter. I, I take my time. I think about every single cut that I make before I make it. I, I This is a very slow process. I'm not like Sean. Sean's like, ah, just going crazy. And that's the way his stuff looks great like that. Mine is, my cutting is very methodical and slow. Yeah. And and angled, I have angle all oh, billion different angles going on here of cuts that I have to make. And um, but the birch is is really good for it holds up to over a long printing. I don't do additions really anything more than 40 usually. And uh, I try to keep them around 25, an addition of 25. I, I always felt like these things should be an event when when somebody gets one of them. I don't like the idea of 200, 300 copies of something out there. I like, I like the idea that if someone's going to pay that amount of money for a, a contemporary print, they should, it should be a special thing that they're getting it. So I purposefully keep my editions low. And then I sell the blocks. Okay. I sell my blocks to collectors. Uh, so I do what's called a soft cancel of it, which means that I'll carve a little X. Like, I'll put an X right there. Yeah. In there, so that the image still works. I'll pick a hard, heavy area black, and I'll put an X through it, and I'll sign that as a cancellation. Yeah.